While many of us recently flocked to try out a new artificial intelligence app, some people pause to ask, where does this go now? A Canadian futurist who is founder and CEO of the tech education company Way has put a lot of thought into what's ahead. Her name is Sinead Bovell. She's on the United Nations Generation Connect Visionaries Board and a contributor to Wired Magazine. And Sinead Bovell joins us now. Hi. Hello. Thanks. It's such a pleasure to meet you in person. I've been following you on all the social media, so it's nice <laughs> to see you in person. You too, you as well. Uh, so you're a futurist. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? I think the name sounds a lot more glamorous and mysterious than it is, but essentially tracking a lot of data points, both qualitative and quantitative, and using it to build forecasts uh, and future scenarios. So tracking things from emerging technologies to patents to who's a company hiring, and using that to kind of make forecasts about where we could be headed. So you mentioned for forecasts, not predictions. Absolutely not predictions. That's yeah. an entirely different wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we seem to be um, living in what media is always saying. We're living in unprecedented times. And, and a lot of people, I think, are feeling maybe less optimistic than they have in the last little while. As a futurist, what makes you optimistic about the future? Right, so I think if we even just look at the trajectory of history, we have been improving in a lot of key metrics for humanity over time. Uh, but when we look out into the future, a lot of the problems that we face today, we have solutions for. Uh, it's just about humans making the right decisions and, and steering our future in the right direction. But I think a lot of the, the key critical problems that we're facing today, we can solve them. Uh, we just have to make the choice to do so. And so that's what keeps me quite optimistic and knowing that the optimistic scenarios are very much possible. And I think um, I want to come back to the decisions because tech seems to be moving at a faster pace than ever before. And sometimes the decisions we make now might not be decisions we make 10 years from now, but we'll get back to that in a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you also help millennials and Gen Z enter the tech space. What's the demand been like over the past few years? In terms of them stepping into the, mm -hmm. the workforce? Do they feel more empowered to be in that space? I think they feel a lot more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for, for Gen Z, uh, technology has been a platform for them to use their voices. So I think their approach to it uh, is a lot more inspiring, a lot more encouraging, a lot, I'd say, a little bit more optimistic uh, than other generations. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're doing enough to educate people around it? Because I have uh, two small kids. And uh, over, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, they were online. And then before that, pediatrician said, no screens, no tech. And now it seems to be this little, like, push and pull. Um, we relied so much on technology during the pandemic for many different things. But then now it's like, oh, no, we can't. Um, so do you, do you think that we know, do you think that we're, we know enough to make the decisions that we need to make forward? Or do we just need more education around it? I think a lot more education around it. And I think, uh, for starters, a lot of our uh, vision of what technology is is devices. Uh, but technology is things like software as well, so artificial intelligence. So tech education really needs to include those types of concepts for, for children as well, so they're prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just a matter of do we use iPads or do we not. Uh, should an AI be making this decision about us? Uh, or if an algorithm put this piece of information in front of us, can I think critically to know why it did that? Uh, those are the types of areas of tech education that I think are important, and I don't think we do enough of that. Um, you are Canadian, mm -hmm. but you work in the States. Uh, is, is it more challenging to enter the tech space here in Canada? In the last few years, I'd say no. I think Canada has really done a great job in opening technology as a lane mm -hmm. uh, and really helping some companies uh, form and, and build more of a sector here. Uh, prior to that, potentially, but uh, Canada is a strong, a strong player in the world of technology. Uh, I don't think we talk about it enough, but, but we're playing a pretty big role. Well, you did um, uh, a tech talk uh, earlier this year, or last year, in 2022, and you shared this tech talk about digital avatars. Right. And I'm just going to tell the audience, just prepare to have your mind blown. We're going to show a clip of it. This is Shudu Graham. She's a striking South African model, likely on the path to a supermodel. Scroll through her Instagram. You can see all of the big campaigns she's landed. She's been featured in Vogue a few times, which is kind of like the Holy Grail. And she's also an activist. She uses her platform as a rising black supermodel to call for more diversity in fashion. And I think that's incredibly admirable. There's another fact about Shudu. She isn't real. Okay, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so Shudu is part of uh, an emerging field of digitally generated people, so digital avatars. She isn't powered by AI, she's a digital construction, uh, but she books campaigns. She's been featured in Vogue quite a few times, and avatars and AI as digital humans will play a role in our future. Fashion modeling, uh, spokespeople, news anchors, we'll, we'll start to see them kind of creep into to more and more industries. You said news anchors and I started getting a little hot under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, every industry is gonna have to prepare for the future of work. Uh, and I think it seems a little bit shocking to see an AI or an avatar in the world of fashion modeling because we previously believed jobs that were more in creative industries were immune to technology. Uh, but I don't think any any lane really is. Okay, but let's unpack this a little bit because um, in the world of fashion, and you've been a model mm -hmm. before, in the world of fashion, there's not there aren't that many uh, women of color in modeling, um, and there are not there are very few women who are dark skin. So she's booking campaigns, which means that she's making money. Um, first, who's behind Shudu and what other, I guess, complications does this create? Right, so the person who created and who controls Shudu is white and male, which means the future is heading in a direction where people can create and control identities outside of their own ethnic groups. This doesn't inherently have to be a bad thing, but it does provide a lot of opportunity for exploitation. So in the case of Shudu, you mentioned uh, Profit, for example. Shudu represents a real black fashion model, but the income her identity generates isn't going to black women. It's going to her creator, a white man. So we are financially shutting out black women uh, from these opportunities while their identity is still being profited off of. Uh, and for me, this raises quite a few red flags. What other red flags does it raise for you? Uh, so there's the idea of one being misrepresentation. Um, Judo is designed through the lens of, of a white man's vision. So her skin tone, hairstyles, all of that, it's, it's through his version of what he finds desirable. So there's a lot of opportunity for stereotyping, appropriating and misrep misrepresentation, which marginalizes real black women. Um, and if you look at this kind of as a, as, a, as a lens to the future, you could see it playing out as a loophole for companies, right? So instead of having to invest in diversity or improve company culture, a company could just hire or create avatars instead from different ethnicities and kind of manipulate the, the relationship those groups may have with that company. Uh, so those kind of raise some red flags to me. And I think the final one is that we have to remember access to the market that creates avatars like Shudu and especially more advanced ones that will be par powered by AI. It's not equal. There are certain structural challenges that make it harder for some communities to access resources, the time, skill, the capital to build these types of avatars. So we're more likely to see some dominant cultures uh, be the creators and owners and controllers, um, again, margin further marginalizing already con marginalized communities. AI has been around for a while now. Why do you think we're, we're more concerned about it now? I think we are waking up to, we interface with it uh, a lot more. Um, I mean, social media has been a platform to kind of get these stories out a little bit faster. But I think it's, it's an intersection of us all just waking up to technology, whether it's uh, how our data is being used, which are the, what are the main companies that are kind of steering our future. We're starting to tune into that. Um, and I think it's a really good thing. Well, we've been hearing a lot about ChatGPT, and Google has its own AI bot, uh, chatbot called uh, Bard, and shares recently um, in Alphabet, Google's parent company, sank more than 7%, knocking $100 billion off the firm's market value uh, when it answered a question incorrectly that was posted in an advert on Twitter. Um, but it still seems like an uncertain time for chatbots. What's your take? I think chatbots are going to be the future of how we largely interface with the internet and with technology. Uh, I think that they will play quite a dominant role. Um, when it comes to Google versus ChatGPT or OpenAI or, or Microsoft, I think that competition is good for, for us and mm -hmm. for consumers. Uh, it forces companies to innovate and bring, bring better products to, be more accountable, to market. Yes, what does concern me with chatbots is that they aren't actually intelligent, right? They don't know what they're saying, uh, and they sound incredibly scholarly, uh, but it could be complete nonsense. And when you have companies then competing uh, for a first place or to kind of be the first mover, it can get sloppy. Uh, and AI is a serious technology. It's not, it's not a joke to kind of mess around with. Uh, and so in this instance where, where Google 
Google's chatbot Bard said something you know, incorrect, if it had a lot more significance, if somebody was using that piece of information to make a critical decision with, uh, then that's not so great and it's not so you know, inconsequential. You mentioned earlier about the displacement of uh, jobs. I just wanted to go through some um, information here for a second, and then mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that. Uh, the World Economic Forum released a report in 2020 saying that COVID shifted the way we work. The report concluded that the workforce is automating faster than expected, and that 85 million jobs will be displaced by 2025, which is now two years away. Uh, the robot revolution will create 97 million new jobs, but communities most at risk from disruption will need support from businesses and governments, analytical thinking, uh, creativity and flexibility among the top skills needed, data and artificial intelligence, content creation, and cloud computing will be the top emerging professions. And the most competitive businesses will be those that reskill and upskill current employees. Is there a risk that this move towards automation won't create jobs um, more equitably? Absolutely. I think that the fact or the point about it creating more jobs uh, is correct. I think if we look at historical trend lines, uh, technology has net-net led to, to more, more industries, new avenues. Uh, but how those jobs get created, who has access to them, uh, and who is given the resources, time, and skills to pivot towards them, that can absolutely be uh, a problem in terms of, of equity. And if we look in even the last 10 years, how income has kind of been divided, mm -hmm. it isn't trending in a direction that's favorable uh, or equal. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that's something that we need to be tuning into. Do you think, though, that maybe in some ways we're kind of just um, kind of, it's going to happen if, eventually, right? So should we not adjust to this uh, very real probability? Yeah, I think we, the technology isn't going away. Um, our future workforce will be more augmented by it than less. Uh, so we do need to, to lean into it uh, and try to minimize the potential gaps. I think if there's anything we can learn from the Industrial Revolution uh, is that you have to take care of your society and your citizens because uh, that's where the real problem lies, when people are left kind of to fend for themselves uh, economically, uh, their purpose and otherwise. I think we now, the result, the numbers are in. Mm -hmm. We know which direction we're headed towards. We have an opportunity to prepare people as best we can. And I think it's really important that we, we take that. Um, AI goes beyond a chatbot. Now there are tools out there that can mimic someone's voice and create images that kind of like, there's been times when I'm like, is this real? Is this not real? There was a recent video of Steph Curry just like, you know, hitting the, the net, like getting the basket from all over the court. And I thought it was real. It was not real. Um, <laughs> what are the concerns around that? Mm -hmm. around authenticity mm -hmm. and transparency. And even just maybe like, you know, the deep fakes that we're seeing. Right, I think uh, deep fakes present quite a critical political, geopolitical threat um, that we don't really have a solution for at this point. Uh, and the truth about deep fakes is it's not just that we are at risk of believing what's not true, um, but that we stop believing what is true. We come, become so disoriented in a sea of all this information uh, that we lack a critical discourse and, and direction. Uh, and I think that that's a real risk. And we have already started to see in some you know, ge geopolitical situations, mm -hmm. deep fakes being used, um, but we were able to kind of detect that. There have been companies that have had systems or, or Microsoft has been a big, big player in kind of flagging that. Mm -hmm. But it's very much a cat mouse scenario. We don't have an actual plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do think Deep fakes present quite an emerging threat, uh, and that should be part of the, the tech education curriculum and discussion points. How do we spot these? How do we know to even look for them in the, in the first place? What about voice mimicking? Mm -hmm, that as well. I would kind of put that, so there's deep fake audio, deep fake visual. Um, I would kind of lump that all in together. Mm -hmm. um, and the technology is just further advancing. So you had men mentioned chat, uh, GPT. There are similar technologies where you can take a three second clip of somebody's voice and use it to generate an entire podcast that they never were featured on. Um, and so on the one hand, it's gonna be great for creators and all of these new tools and resources. Uh, but on another end, it's the disinformation and misinformation can be produced at a fraction of the cost um, and at a fraction of, of the speed. Uh, and that, I think, is quite an emerging threat that we need to tune into. Um, th that's uh, very nerve-wracking. Did you, uh, recently, when you were talking about, uh, we're talking about the mimicking of the voices, but 
when we talk about art, you know, art comes from a place of experience and emotion and um, someone's perspective. But recently there was um, this, uh, I guess, not controversy, but more conversation uh, about this one app that could create images of all of us that were just stunning. Uh, where, what are your thoughts about that? Like the um, AI in the spaces kind of in art and uh, creating works of poetry and literature? Mm -hmm. So I think there's definitely been a lot more uh, hesitance or kind of pushback on AI stepping into these creative realms. Uh, and for many reasons, I think up until this point, we thought creativity was something that's uniquely human. And to see it be synthesized uh, by an AI system, it's very alarming because it changes how we relate to ourselves as humans, right? Poetry, um, art, music, those are things that we think only some humans are even naturally endowed with. Mm -hmm. And to see it get passed to a machine uh, seems very jarring. Um, but I think every single industry is gonna be impacted by technology. Uh, and the world of the arts is, is no different. And I'm looking forward to what could be unleashed uh, in an optimistic way when we all have access to creative tools. Mm -hmm. um, I do think if you are more naturally endowed with artistic skill, you could use an AI system much better uh, than somebody who can't paint or, or make music. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it's that you know, artists go away, they can you know, adopt these tools for themselves. But I think that there will be some magic to, to happen when we all have access to these systems to help bring different types of content or creative expression to life. Is that the optimism that you were talking about that one day possibly we would all have access to these tools? Yeah, I think um, that would be the goal that we could all kind of have a access to them. I think, of course, there are risks that come again with, with everybody have access, having access to these types of tools. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it could be quite a great turning point uh, for society if we use them and adopt them correctly um, and we're informed in, in how to utilize them. Well, there's been more effort on AI regulation in recent years. The AI Act in Europe, uh, those potentially concerned about chatbots being used in class assignments, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on regulation and reaction to emerging tech? Mm -hmm. So there is the, when it comes to ChatGPT and the recent chatbots, some schools have leaned to just ban it outright. Um, and I think we're- The schools might ban it, but the kids will find a way to use the it. The kids are gonna use it anyways. And I think we're moving in the wrong direction because the purpose of education is to prepare students for the economy of tomorrow. And that economy is gonna be largely underscored by technology such as ChatGPT and other AI systems. So we really do need to be equipping kids uh, with not even just the skills to utilize these tools so they can actually be productive people in the economy, uh, but to utilize them safely, right? So when we have conversations around misinformation and disinformation and the risks these systems present, uh, if we're just banning them, uh, we're banning an opportunity uh, for the next generation to adopt these tools wisely uh, and steer their future in a, in a direction that they want to use it or to, for it to go, sorry. And I think most of our current education systems is, are largely transitioning or encouraging kids for jobs of the past, not transitioning into the jobs of the future. Uh, and that means we've got to adopt these technologies, we've got to lean into them, uh, and we have to also equip students with the skills to build them as well. To be, uh, in, in, instead of being, um, I guess, content, instead of just being the users, actually be the creators. Mm -hmm. Be the creators and, and the critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, when social media became a part of our lives, I think a lot of us didn't realize um, that putting so much of our personal information might come back later to bite us. Uh, parents sharing photos of their children. I've done this and I did it without consent when they were younger. Um, and if you are younger, you might share something that decades later might impact your employment. And sometimes scammers only need your email address to destroy your life. Um, should all jurisdictions be following the EU's lead with their right to be forgotten privacy law? Absolutely. I think data for many reasons uh, could be a national security crisis. Uh, having a bunch of, having citizen data just open, uh, manipulated, accessible to not only just different companies, but different countries. Uh, I think that that's a really big red flag. Uh, and then of course, for, for personal reasons, you should be, have the right to be forgotten uh, or for a company not to be able to make a statistical prediction as to what your next moves are gonna be uh, because they've been hoarding a seri bunch of information on you uh, throughout your life. So I think the EU is definitely moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think companies would, or countries sorry, would be wise to, to follow suit. Do you think that maybe this is in part um, why some people are skeptical of AI technology and maybe this future of automation? 
because it just kind of feels as if you're the user, but not you're not in control of what's happening around you. Mm -hmm. I think the the fear and kind of pessimism towards AI in the future, there's a few reasons. Some of it's pop culture related, mm -hmm. tuning into shows like Black Mirror, The Matrix. Um, but then again, yes, of course, a lot of our interactions with technology, uh, we feel like it's happening to us, uh, not with us. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it seems like there's five or six companies uh, and maybe seven or eight people kind of steering our future, uh, and that feels quite alarming, but I think if you equip people with the right information and tools to participate in creating the technologies um, that they're going to be using, I think that can change kind of the discourse and, and the direction. And at the beginning of the pandemic, work for a lot of people changed. Um, a lot of people, uh, if you were able to, you were able to work from home. Kids were learning online, as I mentioned. What would you say are the upsides to the future of work? Right, so I think the pandemic showed us who were we incorrectly excluding from the workforce? Because we falsely assumed that everybody had to show up nine to five, Monday to Friday. Uh, that opened up a whole new door for, for new parents or people with different mobility needs. Uh, so that was a, a kind of key shining light. Uh, I think the future of work is going to be a lot more flexible. So we've already been moving away from the days where you work for a single company for 10 years, uh, and that trend is going to continue. The, pandemic and, and technology showed us that flexibility can work. Uh, and it kind of prepared us for what more remote and more transient uh, kind of workplaces look like. And I think that that is something that's, that's optimistic and, and helpful. Well, from your view, um, I think for employees, it works uh, to have a little bit of leverage now. But from the perspective of the employers, how are they taking that future of work? Are they adjusting well? Or are they going to fight it, maybe? Uh, I, I guess it kind of depends on the company. And I think we are adjusting well as employees, but I think we don't even fully realize what's coming. So uh, when I say more remote work, or um, what I'm really referring to is in a world where smart machines uh, learn new tricks over time, it becomes much less likely that a company is going to hire for a full-time role if that role is going to be radically changed in the next year or two years. Uh, so we're going to see a rise of, of the gig economy uh, across all jobs. So we see a lot of, you know, whether you're a delivery you know, driver or whatnot, we'll see it across financial analysts, lawyers, physicians, teachers, uh, where we all work in kind of different roles for a few different companies at any one time. Um, and in, in terms of are we embracing that, are companies embracing that, uh, I don't think we're, we're ready yet. Uh, but I think things like remote work have been helpful in kind of laying the foundation for how those systems and infrastructures could operate. Um, a few, couple of years ago, you wrote how we need to stop asking uh, kids what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, what did you mean by that? Hmm. And I know that that question is usually asked with the best intention. Uh, but the reality is, most of the jobs that uh, a child would see today or, or answer that question with probably won't exist by the time they are in a working age, or they'll be radically transformed. Uh, so instead of kind of setting people up, and it's not for, for failure, but um, for the idea that your identity is attached to the job that you do, when we know the future of work is going to be very different, we should be encouraging kids to think more broadly about the problems that they want to solve. Um, because those are, are more likely to exist than a specific occupation. Um, and especially as technology continues to more rapidly disrupt the workforce, we have to move away from this idea that you are your job, um, because that's going to change. So if we can start with kids and encouraging them, you know, what are the skills that you want to learn and the problems that you want to solve? Um, and one of the most important skills for the future being critical thinking and imagination, that's something that children are already naturally endowed with. Lean into that. The curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, when you said that, I kind of felt like, oh, I think that might, that might, that's hard for people to hear. It is, but you know, 15 years ago, the role of a social media manager analyst didn't exist. Now, if a company doesn't have one, you're probably not going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the trend lines aren't very different. There are significant, and you, whether you're a, a data analyst, a data scientist, all of these jobs have really come to the forefront in, in the last decade. Um, and so that's still going to continue going forward. But I think the future always seems a lot more shocking from the present, and especially when we analyze it uh, through the frameworks of the present. Um, how can we empower, then, uh, people to embrace technology and to leverage it? 
I think leaning into it, you know, the, the best thing we can do about the future is prepare for it. It's not going to go away. Um, to recognize how much you already use it. I don't know about you. I can't get down the street without consulting maybe Google Maps. Uh, so we use AI it, all of the time, social media, if you watch a streaming platform. So to know that these tools aren't as overwhelming as we might make them out to be. They're very actually easy to, to use, but it's about leaning into it, um, doing your best to try to understand it and, and keep up with the discourse with it. Um, and then of course, at, at a more societal and federal level, level, equipping people with the resources they're gonna need to thrive uh, in such a dynamic future. Sinead, it's been amazing having you here. I, I could talk to you for another hour. Thank you so much. Um, continued success to you. Thank, Thank you. you, all mm -hmm. the best. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.